think um, our next speaker needs an introduction. I'm sure most people know her. Um, it is the amazing, formidable, and everything above, uh, Dr. Zoe Harkin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I noticed they've put the little people on first, so I think they raise it tomorrow for Andreas. So get, get the pocket rockets out of the way. Right, I'm going to talk about dietary fat guidelines and should they have been introduced. And this is the agenda that we're going to go through over the next 45 minutes. We're going to start off with some facts about food and fat because it's really important to get the basics right. We're then going to look at what were those dietary guidelines? When were they introduced? Why were they introduced? And what has happened since? The uh, subject of my PhD was essentially to look at those dietary guidelines in four parts and to use a modern technique of meta-analysis to revisit those guidelines to say if we had had this tool at the time what would the evidence have told us? So the four parts were essentially to look at the randomised controlled trial evidence by meta-analysis available at the time, then to look at the epidemiological evidence, also called population evidence, then to bring it up to date, what does the randomised control trial evidence tell us today, the same for the epidemiology, bring that up to date, and then to look at other reviews of the evidence, because you shouldn't just take my word for it, and then we'll wrap everything up. So, some facts about food and fat to start off with. Not many people seem to know that protein is in every single thing that we put in our mouths other than one pure carbohydrate, which is sucrose, and then pure fats, which would be oils and lard. Butter is not a pure fat. It's pretty close, but it has some protein. So you've got those two extremes, defining carbohydrate and fat, and then in between, everything from lettuce to beans to steak contains protein. Now, interestingly, I think it's really interesting anyway, the nature splits carb proteins and fat proteins. So we have things here that vegans would eat, and we have things here that vegans wouldn't eat. So on the carb protein side, and the closer you get to the carbohydrate end, the more that food has carbohydrates. So if you look at fruit and veg, they're almost entirely carbohydrate of the part that isn't water. As you move into grains, beans, and pulses, you get in closer to that brown bit in the middle. There are traces of fat in grains and pulses. You may be interested to look at packets next time. The middle foods are quite rare. Nature only puts carb, fat, and protein in good measure in a couple of foods, and that's your nuts and seeds, an avocado, if you want to call it a fruit or a nut. That's your unusual middle category. And then you've got your fat proteins, which are the things that come from faces, the things that vegans don't eat. And again, at this end, you've got far less in the way of carbohydrate. In fact, meat and fish generally are zero carbohydrate other than liver for the glycogen at the time the animal was killed. Eggs, effectively, at zero carbohydrate, just a trace. Dairy, for those of you who count carbs, you'll know fluid dairy can get up to about 5 to 10 grams per 100 grams. So again, you've got that convergence in the center. Now, why is all of that so interesting? Apart from the fact that nature doesn't naturally put carbs and fats in the same food, that's the things that manufacturers have worked out is unnatural, irresistible, moorish, addictive, makes you fat. So that's the unique properties of fake food. Natural food doesn't have that. Well, when you set a dietary guideline, and you know what the total fat dietary guideline is, to have no more than 30% of your calories in the form of fat, when you set that guideline, because protein is in everything, what tends to happen is protein approximates to about 15% of any natural diet, whether it's a vegetarian diet or a meat diet, as so long as it's a real food diet, none of these protein shake bits of nonsense, you've got about 15% that's protein. So as soon as you've set fat as 30%, there's only three things that we eat. The rest is taken up by carbohydrate. Now this is why a low fat diet has to be, sorry, a low carb diet has to be a high fat diet because you've got the same situation. If you don't eat skinless chicken breasts and white fish ad infinitum, you will tend towards that sort of 15% protein. You've then got a very low carbohydrate intake, 
fat has to take up the rest. When you see what is happening with fat and carbohydrate just being the flip sides of each other, you start to realise the consequences of the dietary guidelines. Now, facts about fat which are not widely known. Now, who on this slide, apart from Trudy, who called out last year, it's the only slide from last year's presentation, um, who knows which of these products has more saturated than unsaturated fat? You've got a sirloin steak, eggs, mackerel, lard, almonds, olive oil, low-fat milk. Don't I won't embarrass you? Low the low-fat milk. Because the facts about fat that are really important to take home. Number one, every single food that contains fat contains all three fats. Saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. There are no exceptions. So when people talk as if you can avoid saturated fat and only eat monounsaturated fat, they are showing their nutritional ignorance. The second thing you might like to know is that only dairy products as a food group have more saturated than unsaturated fat. Sure, you've got the odd oil, coconut oil, that has more saturated fat than some other oils, but we're looking at food groups here. Dairy is the only one that has more saturated than unsaturated fat. So you put the rest of this data on, and this is freely available from the United States Department of Agriculture All Foods Database. Your first number on that slide is the total grams of fat per 100 grams, and the second is the saturated fat. And there are some postcards outside for those of you who want to pick one of these up, really useful to keep in your pocket or your handbag for when people tell you meat is full of saturated fat. You can show them the sirloin steak and you can say, actually, it's about 2% saturated fat for this typical example that I picked. And then you can have some fun with the current dietary guidelines because we are told to eat oily fish but not to eat red meat in the name of total fat and saturated fat. Well, oily fish has got twice the total fat and one and a half times the saturated fat of red meat. Oily fish is great, don't get me wrong. The dietary guidelines are wrong. Look at olive oil. It has 14 times the total fat of sirloin steak because it is a pure fat, but it also has seven times the saturated fat. And then people say, but you wouldn't eat 100 grams of olive oil. No, but one tablespoon of olive oil has more saturated fat than a 100 gram pork chop. And that's when our dietary guidelines start getting really daft. And I have to just mention lard before we move on. Lard is, of course, mostly unsaturated fat. The main fat in lard is monounsaturated fat. Again, you'll be told, as with eggs, they're full of saturated fat. So we've got the basics out of the way. The dietary fat guidelines were introduced in 1977 by the Senator McGovern Committee, and they then became part of the dietary guidelines for Americans, which are revised every five years. They started in 1980. The most recent revision was 2015, and the UK followed suit. So 1983, the National Advisory Committee on Nutritional Education set the guidelines for the UK, and those were then embedded in the 1984 cardiovascular coma report. It's a very well-known report just as a coma report. And essentially what those dates did was to effect a U-turn in our dietary advice from, and I always credit Gary Tobes for finding this, it's from Good Calories, Bad Calories. He found it from Tanner's Practice of Medicine from 1869 farinaceous, flowery, and vegetable, interesting. Foods are fattening, and saccharine, sugary matters are especially so. And we believed that up until the point that we changed dietary guidelines. And then this is an extract from the 1984 Coma Report. We basically said, we previously used to think you needed to control carbohydrates. We now don't think that. Not we've now got the evidence to show that we were wrong. We now just don't think that. And we now think you should be controlling your diet so that you have no more than 30% of your calories in the form of total fat, no more than 10% in the form of saturated fat. And that is a summary of the dietary fat guidelines. And back to those pie charts, it is so important to remember that we don't tell people to eat carbohydrates because we know that they're healthy. We don't even know that they're safe. But the minute you set a dietary fat guideline of 30%, you are automatically setting a carbohydrate intake of 55%. And they are still trying to lower the saturated fat guideline, sorry, the total fat guideline. They would happily have us at around 25%. And then, of course, carbohydrates goes up to 
So why did we do this? Well, I love numbers. For those of you who follow me, you'll probably know that. And I kind of wonder why at the end of each year, if a third of people are dying from heart disease, why am I not deleting a third of the numbers on my mobile? because I don't know that many people who've died from heart disease. And this, it's useful to put in context, we, we've got to remember just how prevalent heart disease is because it will suit organisations of statins and so on to make us think that one in three of our friends is going to die over the next year. In 1950, when this started becoming the big issue, the death rate in the US from all causes was 1.45%, which is about 1,400 people in 100,000. Now, about 589 in 100,000 were dying from heart disease. So you can either present heart disease as 0.59% in any one year, or you can present it as, of the people who died, 40% of them died from heart disease. And that's what we do. So we're making this a bigger issue than we need to. All of these dietary guidelines came about because of heart disease. Now, the chap on the right, um, Ansel Keys, rightfully got credit in Jason's presentation for the brilliant Minnesota starvation experiment. He was the man of the moment in 1950. He was the one who wanted to turn his attention to heart disease. And he was familiar with the work of the Russian pathologists at the start of the 20th century. And the Russian pathologists were studying rabbits. Um, and they had observed in their pathology examinations some blockage, some build-up in the arteries of human subjects that they were doing autopsies on. And they identified that blockage as cholesterol, blood cholesterol. So they tried to see if dietary cholesterol had anything to do with blood cholesterol. So they gave a lot of cholesterol to rabbits um, because it was more ethical than testing humans. <coughs> and sure enough, the bunny rabbits didn't do too well. Now, for those of you who know anything about food and cholesterol, you will know that cholesterol is only found in foods of animal origin. Vegans do not eat dietary cholesterol. So those rabbits were being given animal foods. And for any of you who know veterinary stuff or just have a rabbit at home, you'll know that they don't eat animal foods. So is it any wonder that poor Bugs Bunny clogged up with whatever these guys were putting into it? I've just remembered I forgot to tell you the um, bottom left-hand number. I haven't clogged the slides up with all the references, but on the bottom left hand of the slide, if you go to a PhD references, the first slide basically had the PhD references on it and all the references are on there. So you could go back and look at any of those. I'll send the links around. The presentation will, will be on my site anyway. So apologies for getting that one. So Ansel Keys basically wanted to look at heart disease. He tried to replicate those experiments on the rabbits in human subjects in the early 1950s. And to do that, he failed the human subjects dietary cholesterol. This was before ethics, so he could give them abundant amounts of meat, fish, eggs and dairy and see what happened to their blood cholesterol. And this is the most important quote I have ever found from Ansel Keys, the so-called father of the diet heart hypothesis, on the key elements of the diet heart hypothesis. It's from a symposium on atherosclerosis in 1954, and he said the evidence, both from doing experiments and also from looking at populations, is that the cholesterol content of the diet has no impact on either the blood cholesterol level or atherosclerosis in man. Now, he knew that cholesterol only occurred in foods of animal origin. So having administered cholesterol, he's administered animal foods, and he has exonerated cholesterol. He has exonerated animal foods. Animal foods do not cause cholesterol in the blood to rise or atherosclerosis. He should then have gone after the one macronutrient that is not typically in animal foods, which is carbohydrate. But he didn't, he couldn't get away from his belief that fat was the key thing with heart disease. But he'd shown if cholesterol has no effect, then foods of animal origin have no effect. So we're moving into the PhD bits now. And the RCT evidence that was available at the time, this was published in a paper in February 2015, and it kind of caught on. The world went a little bit mad over this paper. 
The Guardian got it right by saying the FAT guidelines lacked scientific evidence. Um, for those of you who know the Mail, you might not be surprised that the Mail got it wrong. Um, the Mail headline was, butter isn't bad for you after all. I'm sorry, but the study didn't even look at butter. Um, but hey, don't let, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, the Telegraph got it right. We should not have introduced those dietary guidelines. Um, the Express sadly also got it wrong. Fat is the key to living longer. We don't know that. We don't know if it will make you live longer or less long. We just know the dietary guidelines should not have been introduced and America picked it up and the Sydney Morning Herald and the New Zealand Herald that was the paper and the reason I say all that it was it was the most impactful 64th most impactful paper in 2015 across any discipline from climate change to child psychology nutrition whatever that shows the level of interest that there is in what we in this room do and we have to harness that interest to be able to go back to those people who are hungry for evidence and information to say that what has been presented so far has been wrong. So that first paper looked at all the RCT evidence available at the time and there were only six trials and the bottom one was not available to the American committee because it was published a year after the committee met. They met in 1977. And you'll be familiar with some of those trials, the Rose Corn Oil Trial, the LA Veterans Dayton Study, the Oslo Diet Heart Study, Sydney Diet Heart Study. They only studied men. So no women were included. That was one of the things that intrigued the media as well. They were almost entirely sick men. You've got the S in brackets for secondary subjects, P for primary, only one of the studies mixed secondary and primary subjects. You've then got the length of time and you've got the dietary intervention. Now, when you put all of that into meta-analysis, what meta-analysis can do is effectively pool all the results from all the different studies to say if we look at them all together and it weights them accordingly in terms of the quality of the data, the length and so on, what does it tell us? Now that line in the middle, this is called a forest plot, for those of you who may not have seen it, they're becoming increasingly prevalent in academic papers today. The line of no effect is that line with the one going through it. And if the intervention did better, the diamond would be over to the right hand side. If the control did better, you were better off leaving the people alone, then the diamond is off to the left hand side. You can see that for all cause mortality, it's absolutely on the line of no effect. The dietary interventions altogether had no effect. For coronary heart disease deaths, it's absolutely on the line of no effect. The interventions had no effect on coronary heart disease. So this was the summary that that paper was able to present. We've got those two dietary guidelines. No RCT had actually tested those two guidelines. One had tested the 10% saturated fat, which was the Woodhill intervention, but as an individual intervention, that ended up producing more deaths in the intervention than in the control, and there were significantly more deaths as well. I think, as Malcolm Kendrick would say at this point, oops, because um, you've done your intervention and it didn't work out as planned. Um, from all-cause mortality, those are just the numbers. You've got 370 plays 369, absolutely neck and neck. Coronary heart disease, very slightly different, but not statistically significantly different. To all intents and purposes, no impact of doing those dietary interventions. This one was a really interesting, unexpected finding. Blood cholesterol levels on average fell in the intervention groups and in the control groups. They fell by more in the intervention groups, but it had no impact on coronary heart disease. So when somebody says to you, you can intervene with a diet and lower cholesterol. If you want a paper that you can use to rebut that, the reference is in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, I have a theory as to why that happened. And there's a, another paper reference there, which I did with my supervisor, on plant sterols. And if you administer vegetable oils, they contain things called plant sterols, which is effectively plant cholesterol. The plant cholesterol then competes with human cholesterol in the gut and replaces it to an extent but it doesn't help heart disease. In fact, the paper we published shows it's actually detrimental to heart disease, but it will lower your cholesterol. Now, if you trust that your body's making the right cholesterol, then don't take plant sterols, don't consume vegetable oils in any substantial quantities. That's why I think cholesterol fell more in the intervention groups, but it didn't help heart disease, possibly even uh, the counter. 
And this is the one that caught the media interest. Recommendations were made for 276 million Brits and Americans and then New Zealand, Australia, everyone else followed. Having studied fewer than 2,500 sick men, we have an expression in meta-analysis where we say, are the results generalizable? Does the analysis have generalizability? Can we apply it to the whole population? Unless you've studied the whole population, you can't. So this basically says it doesn't work for sick men. It is not going to work for healthy women, but we still introduce those guidelines. And finally, no one study recommended change. In fact, they cautioned. The Research Committee 1965 study said, final sentence of that paper, a low-fat diet has no place in the treatment of myocardial infarction, heart attack. The corn oil study said it's not beneficial and may in fact be harmful. Woodhill cautioned about potential toxicity of the vegetable oil because of the results that he saw. So nobody concluded that we should be doing that. So then you look at the epidemiological evidence at the time. You could have left the PhD there and said the, the hierarchy of evidence is a meta-analysis of RCTs. If it wasn't there, it wasn't there, end of. But let's be fair. The epidemiological evidence has been relied on, and Asim was telling me this morning, Ansel Keys was relied upon again yesterday with some nonsense that came out from the American Heart Association about fat or whatever. So you've got to do the robust analysis. So the evidence at the time, there were again six studies. Um, some of these also you'll be very familiar with, the Western Electric study, the Bank and Bus study, Framingham, and of course the Seven Countries study. Again, only looking at men, at least this time largely looking at healthy men. The one exception being the Seven Countries study, which had some sick men and some healthy men, ranged between four and 20 years. Only a couple looked at cholesterol, so we can't, that shows they didn't even think it was going to be a factor. Um, so we can't look at cholesterol too deeply in this one. But look at this column here. And so few people know this. I did not know this when I went into the PhD, that there was not one epidemiological study, not even the seven country study, that found against total fat and coronary heart disease. So you've got ends in that whole column on total fat. You've got one Y against saturated fat, and that's the seven country study. If you look at this final column, where you look at other factors that each of the study found to be important, you can see smoking, which doesn't surprise us. You can see age of death of father, which wouldn't surprise us. Um, for those of you who like drinking, you'll like Framingham and Honolulu, because that found the more you drank, the less you had heart disease. Um, <laughs> Before you rush out and go and get some alcohol, the obvious confounder there is affluence. The more affluent you are, the more you're able to drink, bearing in mind these date back to the 1960s, and the more likely you are to be better educated, healthcare, and so on. We know the economics of deprivation. But Ansel Keys, look at the box next to the seven country study. Ansel Keys said, there's no relationship with smoking, there's no relationship with activity, and there's no relationship with weight. So we took him to be right on saturated fat when he was wrong on everything that we actually now know to be true. And that is the only epidemiological evidence that was there at the time against saturated fat, against all the other evidence, this very strong man of the moment won through. So let's have a quick look at this seven country study in more detail. It was published in 1970 in circulation, 20 volumes. It had involved 13,000 men, aged 40 to 59 in 1956. Those are the three verbatim conclusions <coughs> from volume 20 of the seven country study. Number one, coronary heart disease tends to be related to cholesterol. Cholesterol tends to be related to saturated fat, and if one is related to two, then two is related to three, and they're all <coughs> related to each other. So you've got that tripartite of fat, cholesterol, and heart disease, which was this picture that he was trying to present. But he didn't come out and say fat causes heart disease or saturated fat causes heart disease. Those are quite caveated conclusions, but they've taken on a whole new dimension. Now, it was 25 years later, again, references on the bottom left, when Minotti, who had worked with Keyes during the Seven Country Study, teamed up with Keyes to write a paper <coughs> on let's look back 25 years on from the Seven Country Study. And what they said was, had we known just the blood cholesterol 
at the time of entering the study, we could have predicted coronary heart disease with a correlation coefficient of 0.72. Now, for those of you who know your stats, if you've got a correlation coefficient of 0.72, the R squared, the strength of the relationship, becomes 0.52. So it explains about as much as it doesn't explain, not necessarily a great factor to be considered. So when I was looking at that data, I put it in um, into my own model to check how Keys had actually done the work, and I noticed a far stronger correlation. And that correlation was latitude. And for the latitude of the seven countries and coronary heart disease, the correlation was 0.96, which gives an R squared of 0.92. It is almost perfect. You can almost stop the research, you found what's going on here. And by cohort, it was still 0.92, and that's for 16 cohorts. So then you say, well, does that make sense? Well, yes, it does make sense. Because as we know, when sunshine shines on the skin, it turns cholesterol into vitamin D. So the countries closer to the equator have lower cholesterol but higher vitamin D. Finland has got higher cholesterol and lower vitamin D. The cholesterol can just be a marker. It can be telling you that actually vitamin D is the thing that would have helped with heart disease and the Finns have got it very low and the Japanese and the Greeks and the Cretans have got it very high. So a much better explanation. So, summary of the epidemiological evidence available at the time, again, you've got six prospective cohort studies, far more people studied this time, none examined the dietary guidelines, but then you wouldn't expect them to because they're just observing populations. The all-cause mortality, the, the data on the epidemiology at the time are not suitable for meta-analysis, so what you can do is look at the mortality rates across all of the studies combined. The all-cause all mortality was just under 5%. And the coronary heart disease mortality was about 1%. Now, here was a really interesting finding of the seven country study that wasn't reported because that was the one study that had healthy people at the start of the study and sick people at the start of the study. And you could then track those two separate arms. And they observed that if you entered the study with coronary heart disease, your chance of dying from coronary heart disease over the next five years was 21% versus 1% if you didn't enter the study with coronary heart disease. So the biggest finding of the seven country study is that the biggest cause of heart disease is heart disease. <laughs> but it's important to note because that is a significant finding. That's why prevention is so important. Don't get people into the system in the first place. None found any relationship with total fat, as you've seen. One found an inter-country relationship with saturated fat. And the why that's the weakest form of evidence. All the other studies were studying the same population, but looking at different dietary factors, smoking, exercise, uh, parentage, and so on. What the seven country wants you to believe is that the heart disease in Japan differed from the heart disease in America, not because of climate or politics or the rate of progress preceding those decades, case for those two different regions of the world or war or Hiroshima or anything else like that but because of the saturated fat content of the diet and that just doesn't make sense. So epidemiology did not support the guidelines either. So we bring it up to date and we move to evidence currently available. This one was published in Open Heart. You carry forward the first six randomized controlled trials, and then there are four more that you need to add in which cover all-cause mortality and coronary heart disease mortality. Again, you may be familiar with some of those, the Minnesota Coronary Survey, the Diet and Reinfarction Trial, and of course the Women's Health Initiative. You've then therefore got some women now involved in the study where you see P, you've got primary intervention, so you've got some healthy people involved in the studies, and you've got anything ranging between one and eight years. So so you pull all of those together again and look what happens. It is again absolutely sat firmly on the line of no effect. And that's all the randomized control trial evidence available today. You then look at coronary heart disease deaths and it's sat firmly on the line of no effect.
So at the time the February 2015 paper was published and Public Health England were pretty hostile um, and pretty aggressive, they did actually concede, okay, maybe the evidence wasn't there at the time, which did surprise me. I thought they may try to hang on to that one, but they said, no, there's no evidence at the time, but of course there is evidence available today. Well, there isn't. We'll come on to the one thing that they try to hang on to and then we'll take that apart as well. So we got... <laughs> A pleasure enjoying this. This is uh, you've got the measure of how this is going. Um, so summary slide: ten RCTs, sixty-two thousand participants. We've got men, we've got women, we've got healthy people, we've got sick people. Uh, we only have one study of healthy people of both gender. The reason I did the inverted commas is the Minnesota Coronary Survey was set in mental institutions in the US and we know that people in mental institutions tend to be on what we would call cardio toxic or cardio complicated medications. So again it's not generalizable to the typical population who's not confined and therefore diet able to be controlled and who's not on some of those medications. None examined those dietary guidelines. Can you believe, you know, here we are in 2017 and we haven't had a study that has actually examined those dietary guidelines. The one that got closest was the STAR, St. Thomas's Atherosclerosis Regression Study, tested 27% total fat, 8-10% to saturated fat, tried to claim that it was a great success. It was based on 55 people. You subject it to further statistical analysis, Fisher's test, all that stuff, it falls away. You've got the mortality numbers there for all cause and heart disease. In one exception only, those 20 results, you've got the two arms, 10 studies, only one, the cholesterol level didn't change that much. Every other study repeated what we saw in the first six studies. Cholesterol fell more in the intervention trials, but it made no difference to mortality, all cause or coronary heart disease. So there, are, there is no current RCT evidence for the guidelines. So you take the epidemiology up to date. This is the last part of the PhD bit. Some of these you'll probably be less familiar with. I certainly was less familiar going into the study with these, maybe the Finnish cancer study. Some of you have heard of the lipid research study, maybe one of the best known. So you've got six um, studies that were then able to be used in meta-analysis. The Cushy study couldn't be. Um, and you can look, therefore, just to start off with, because you know you're about to do meta-analysis, look at what they concluded individually. Crikey, I'm getting a 10-minute warning here. Okay, I'll speed up. Um, look at what they concluded individually and where they had the, the yeses um, showing that they did find just a relationship between total fat and saturated fat. You'd then have to subject those four particular arms to the Bradford Hill test, notwithstanding that all the rest of the evidence didn't support it either, and they'd fail the Bradford Hill criteria. I've, I've done the test. There's your forest plot for epidemiology available today, and there's your forest plot for coronary heart disease deaths and saturated <coughs> fat epidemiology available today. So you've got the same findings there. For the sake of speed, I'll move on to looking at what did other people find? Um, because that was what I find going into the evidence. Um, I don't know if every one of you know, I was vegetarian for 20 years. Um, so I like to think that vegetarian going in to do this kind of research, who went in starting off not eating the meat and the fish and all the rest of it, um, might perhaps even have had a propensity towards finding against animal foods. But the evidence is what the evidence is. Um, and the evidence is that animal foods are the best for us. So let's look at what other people found. Skiaf and Miller, 2009, 28 studies, 280,000 people. This is what doesn't get reported by the media. When you look at the non-significant results, something being sat on the line of no effect is as important as something being off the line of no effect, because it tells you what you don't have to worry about, tell you what doesn't make a difference. So Skiaf and Miller, no difference. Siri Torino, 350,000 people looking at coronary heart disease and saturated fat, no significant difference. We're going to pull out the four reds of significant difference that you're going to see. So there was one finding in a mozafarian study. Hooper, we're coming up to the first of the Cochrane's 2011. Four non-significant results turn the page seven more non-significant non results. So we're 
pull out that red one again, go to Chowdhury, which was published in March 2014. They found one significant result with trans fats, nothing significant with saturated monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fat. Schwinkel, Schack and Hoffman, no significant difference in anything they looked at. And of course, I've just put in one of our papers, no difference in our February 2015. Hooper was then updated in 2015 and it was purely on the back of our February 2015 paper because the public health authorities felt that they needed to counter this idea that was in the public mind that you didn't have to worry about total fat and saturated fat. So Hooper's opening sentence in this 150 page Cochrane report is following recent reports of fat not being important, reference Harkham et al. Um, you know, we feel we need to address this. So good on you. She revisits it. Again, she finds the same one significant difference. So the four that you end up with, Mozafarian, the reference 43 is a paper by Dr. Ufi Ravenskoff with me and a few others saying Mozafarian, you left out the Rose Cornell study, you left out Woodhill and you included the Finnish Mental Hospital study which is not randomised and not controlled. That's, you know, you're a fraud, I should probably say, actually, you, you know, you can't do that. Um, you can't do that and then try and demonise fat on the basis of heart disease. Hooper, we're going to come to on the next page. Chowdhury trans fats associated with heart disease. You're never going to get an argument from me on that one. Wholeheartedly agree. So Hooper is trying to get us to, to think that for cardiovascular events alone, there is a small but potentially important benefit of swapping out saturated fats and swapping in polyunsaturated fats. That's what she thought in 2011, and that's what she reiterated in 2015. What we need to remember is that in 2011, there were 11 results where she couldn't find anything. And in 2015, seven results where nothing could be found. So it bears repeating that there is no significant difference for all cause mortality, CVD mortality, CHD mortality, myocardial infarctions, non-fatal myocardial infarctions, strokes or coronary heart disease events. We have to go back to cardiovascular disease events. And when she said there's a small but potentially significant benefit, we looked at the um, data that was being used for that finding. 11 studies were used in that finding. Only one of those studies actually swapped out saturated fat and swapped in polyunsaturated fat. So she's trying to use 11 studies that had the intention of swapping out those fats but didn't actually document or report that they achieved it as evidence that it made a difference. That's the first problem. Second problem, why did she even find anything that the rest of us didn't? Siri Torino, Schwinkelschack, Hoffman, um, and so on. Because she approached the authors of four other studies that were not about heart disease and said, do you happen to have heart data? Your study on skin cancer, hypercholesterolemia, insulin resistance, diabetes, and found some data, only included 646 people, but it made just sufficient difference to nudge that line off the line of no effect so that you've got something to report. Unpublished data is, of course, non-peer-reviewed data. I've gone back and looked at some of that data, and to say that it's not robust is an understatement. And credit to Trudy, who I know is in the audience here, in this 150-page report, because the studies were so different, there's something called an I-squared number that's reported that should be close to zero, and it was 65%. It's pretty high. Tells you you're in trouble because the studies are very different. So you then have to do a sensitivity test when you do the sensitivity test, the significance falls away. So the abstract should have reported when we did the significance test on the one finding that we would like to put forward to you, notwithstanding that we found loads of stuff that made no difference, that fell away as well. And that would have been an honest reporting of that study. And of course, it's not generalizable because she didn't include a single study of healthy people of both genders. So they hang on to this Hooper 2015. Asim, Pascal Meyer, Rita Redberg had a paper in the BGSM recently attacking the idea that saturated fat is bad for us. And the first thing that they wave is Hooper 2015. Now you know that it is that one little life raft that they're clinging onto in the middle of the Atlantic and that's just gone down as well. Please use that information to go back to these people to say stop using Hooper because it doesn't work. I'll move on from that one. Quick look at the conclusion to all of this. 
Um, the consequences of all of this, Mark Hegstead, one of the writers in the Dietary Guidelines report in 1977, was quoted as saying, there'll be undoubtedly many people who will say we've not proven our point. And some of the senators who were involved in that collaboration and looking at the dietary guidelines noted that there's a distinct lack of consensus among nutritional scientists and other health professionals, which alarmed them. So the narrative of that report says that some people have claimed there could be physical harm from these dietary modifications. However, they just went on and answered their own question. However, the select committee finds that no physical harm or mental harm could ensue from these dietary guidelines. Well, that's the UK chart for obesity. 2.7% it was in 1972. And by the end of the last millennia, 25%. That's when we stopped measuring the UK and devolved healthcare. The US, I love this chart because it's almost like you can draw a line, 1976 to 1980, and then you can see the aeroplane taking off on the right-hand side. So we at least have to examine, is that a coincidence? Or is there something going on with the dietary guidelines? Now, I think there's a way forward. And the way forward is to understand where we've got this saturated fat thing wrong. This is the chart from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans telling you where you will find saturated fat in the American diet. Crap, number one. <laughs> Pizza, desserts, candy, chips, tortillas, more crap. If you want to know what's in the food categories, it's salad dressings and sauces and slimming foods. And I've got the full list. You would not want to read it. Then you've got mixed dishes, and there will be some real food in there, but think takeaways and think microwavable ready meals and think whatever else. Then you've got processed meat, and then you get down to things that we would eat that would contain saturated fat, cheese, milk, butter, nuts, and seeds. Let's look at the UK. This is from the Family Food Survey. You can look at the percentage of the diet that's coming from total fat, saturated fat, and again, junk top category, bread, cakes, biscuits, pastries, sweets. Good to see dairy products nice and high up in the UK. Fats and oils, some of that will be good. Butter will be good. The margarine, the vegetable oils, bad news, olive oil, good, etc. Processed meat and meat products, that's not the stuff that we eat in this room. Real meat, fish and eggs, 7%, other processed food. Do you see how little of the saturated fat intake is coming from what we eat, what we recommend, real food? So can we agree that processed food is the enemy and not saturated fat? And can we therefore agree that the most important dietary guideline that we need to get out to the public is eat real food? Now, if we do that, public health advice will align with public health collaboration advice. And wouldn't that be marvellous? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Beth.